In the early 90s, Americans are introduced to an arresting new kind of TV. I was thinking, man, I don't want to work on this show because you could get shot doing this thing. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! It showed the police as they really are. Can somebody take her? To a public that didn't know. It was amidst this war on drugs. People wanted to see these cops as these superhero individuals. Put your hands up, I can see them. Stay in the car. I think 90s was the best decade for police work. Powder cocaine. The public genuinely loved police officers. I'm on red foot. Get on your stomach. It was white police officers taking advantage of the working class poor. The TV show Cops was part of the selling of an unjust justice system to the American public. very first episode, Cops burst onto TV screens with its brash, in-your-face realism. Take her. Come here, take her. And in the 90s, audiences couldn't get enough. It was a mind blower. In my town, it was what everybody was talking about. That room's okay. clear. All right, double check your rooms real quick. Double check them. What caught people's attention was you can go to your 9-to-5 job, come home at night, and have dinner and sit down in front of the TV and basically be put in the passenger seat of a, of a police car. With its raw, fly-in-the-wall style, Cops was an edge-of-your-seat adrenaline rush. Yep, you were under arrest. You figured that out all by yourself, didn't you? They were in that car, they were in that foot chase, they were in that fight, and they were there handcuffing that guy with you. you gotta have a felony guy. The show was unlike anything television audiences had ever seen. I was seeing on primetime TV the same things I was shooting with my camera in a news setting. Sheriff Department search warrant. I mean, this is how it truly is. Sheriff Department, get down. Get down on the ground, I got it. Okay. It's just really, really good television. Real life, raw, uncut. Some good weeks. This is brand new to television. But what ends up happening with a show like Cops is they can pick and choose what they portray to give us this vision of policing that is not only inaccurate, but is deeply dangerous. Your boyfriend is letting you take the fall for the drug. The success of this new kind of television relied on a very old obsession. America has always had a fascination with crime and cop shows. <laughs> My name's Adrian Sebro. I'm a professor of media studies at University of Texas at Austin, and I teach history of media and television and film. Shows like, you know, Dragnet, Kojak, Columbo, Law & Order. There's always been this love for, you know, crime because and we always want to know, like, who done it. Throughout the 80s, shows with actors playing cops were some of the most popular on television. But there was a gap between, you know, the very scripted kind of TV show and showing what cops really do. That vice that Tubbs and Crockett were fighting in Miami, it looked nothing like the new reality police were facing. Miami, vice. New York. It was amidst this late 80s, early 90s era of this war on drugs. Narcotics violations, robberies, and sexual assaults were up 10.5%. Crack cocaine use leads President Reagan to double down on the so-called war on drugs. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. So won't you join us in this great new national crusade? And as drug-fueled violent crime rises, TV shows glamorizing police work start to lose their luster. So really, cops came at the perfect time. There was this idea from an individual named John Langley. He had a documentary called Cocaine Blues. Malcolm Barber and John Langley got together and made this film documentary. It makes me sneeze. And it makes it hard to find me door. And it was real raw. In the past, you might see somebody with, at a party with a, with a drink in their hand, and uh, 
Now in feature films, you see people with Coke spoons in their nose. The two young producers of Cocaine Blues soon land a job bringing its realism to television. Why cocaine? When I first really got involved with them, they were doing live broadcast. I'm Hank Barr. Okay. And I spent uh, the decade of the 90s working on cops. Before working on cops... American Vice, the real story of the doping of our nation. Barr teams up with Langley on a gritty, unscripted television special starring Geraldo Rivera. Sometime during the course of this live program, you'll be a witness as a pusher goes down for the count. After watching dozens of these raids from very close up. And it was a two-hour live show with inserts of taped drug raids. The idea is to hit swiftly and with overwhelming force. Surprise and shock are the best protection. Not only for the officer. I was thinking that, man, I don't want to work on this show because you could get shot doing this thing. Because we didn't have any, any bulletproof vest, and I could feel this person pushing me into this place with, that we had fogged. Couldn't see anything. And we all could have been shot there. But I looked over my shoulder, and it's Geraldo pushing me in the door. So the excitement was... Definitely there. Oh my gosh. Cool. All right, the deal went down. Uh, it's all on the hidden camera. Basically, While working on the special, ounces, John Langley's crew stumbles on something that will change television. Halfway through, Geraldo had to leave. And so I threw a mic on to the key man that would actually key the door of where we were going to raid. And I would say, you know, we just need to have you talk us through. Anybody's got a set of cuts for this guy? So for the next few hours, we filmed all these drug raids with just the officers narrating. Fully loaded Smith and Wesson 357 Magnum. Oh, excuse me, 44 Special would have ruined our day. There's no narrators, there's no host. These are uh, Teflon coated bullets. You're simply a crew following along with a police department. And that's how Cops was born. John had the concept of cops. He tried to sell it to the networks. So I'm Randy Sutton, and I was a cop for a lot of years, including in the 90s. They said it couldn't be done, never work. And they laughed him out of their office. Langley shops it around to what are then the only networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. But they all turn him down. Network TV isn't ready to buy the realism he's trying to sell. It doesn't surprise me that a television executive in that period of time would just have to scratch your head and go, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm Mark Whaley. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And for many years in the 90s, I was a cameraman on the TV show Cops. When you present to them a radical idea, like, we're going to put a cameraman and a soundman in a, in a car with a policeman, they're just going to chase him around, and whatever he does, we're going to make that a TV show. You want that? No narration, no track, no script. That, that's a preposterous idea, I'm sure, at that time. And he was, he was struggling. I think at one point, he was living out of his car. But Langley's luck is about to change. In 1988, there was a Writers Guild strike. And the Writers Guild strike was huge because it halted many productions, especially on sitcoms, dramas, or other obviously written shows. Striking screenwriters have said no to another contract offered by producers. Suddenly, a show that doesn't use script writers looks attractive to TV executives. On the show Cops, we didn't have to have directors, we didn't have to have writers. It was unscripted. And now there's a new network in town, for the fledgling Fox, a risky concept with a low budget is irresistible. Fox was hungry for contests. They were the young network, so they wanted to embrace that newness with gritty, urban, young TV and production that you can't see anywhere else. When Cops finally makes it to air on March 11th, 1989, it delivers can't-look-away realism rarely seen on the small screen. And she was like, oh, man, this is awesome. This is getting good. Watch this. This is going to be great. 
You crawl on your hands and knees, right, Todd? The format of Cops is simple. Each episode tracks three stories with police kicking ass off the top. What producers see as comic relief in the middle. Now How much you have to drink, Mary? Tell me that. Not nearly enough. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Come on, Mary. Come on, Mary. Come on, Mary. And a finale that shows police serving and protecting. How do you how do you intend to get some food for them? Uh, well, other than they already had supper tonight, mm -hmm. she'll be here first thing in the morning. It's great. To carry something. You? What it does is perpetuate this idea that there are superheroes. So this is a way in which cops continue to construct their idea of criminal and their idea of those who are on the right side of the law. We want to make sure that, that the kids police. were... You want to be a policeman? Yes! Oh, that's like... good. <laughs> okay. What cops ended up doing is creating their own audience. We were on Saturday nights, which is actually the worst night of television, and yet our ratings were going through the ceiling. Our Q rating was above that of The Tonight Show. It was a cult show. I think it was great because the video cameras really weren't out in patrol cars or on officers' bodies back then, like body cameras. So to have those cameras running live the whole entire time, I mean, they were getting exactly what was happening. We just did what we normally would do on a nightly basis. We don't know where his clothes are. The guy that owns his property, his barbershop, and lives upstairs, he says he doesn't know him. Viewers were getting the live version of police work. I don't think your dad wants to see you come to heaven this way. Charles, I love you! I think what John Langley wanted to accomplish with the show right Cops now. was to show the true nature of what policing is. But it turns out John Langley didn't control which aspects of policing the audience got to see. The cops did. These law enforcement agencies had editorial control. The whole ecosystem of policing is getting this sort of washed sort of look, this fairy tale version. Open the comment. But as the 90s roll on, it's painfully clear that for many, it's a fairy tale without a happily ever after. In the early 90s, Cops goes international, with the show's theme song becoming a worldwide hit. It's just hard for me to imagine a better piece of music to use to help brand the show and what it's about. But this song in and of itself is a cultural phenomenon. We see the, the film, Bad Boys, this, this three-part trilogy, it's themed off the song. They, the characters sing the song. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? The chart-topping, Grammy-winning tune is burned into the popular consciousness. Even today, we think about the, that show when we think about that song. But the song also hints at the manipulation tactics of the show it introduces. Reggae music and all its anti-establishment ethics at its core is now promoting a show about one of the, the longest industries that was against people of color, against the uh, working class people, and it's about keeping people in line. The song also helps cops become a pop culture phenomenon. We got a message that there's a witch out here, so we're gonna check it out. You got a kid? Yes, sir. So what's gonna happen to the kid? You get burned to the stake, right? Right? Who takes care of the kid? Huh? I swear, sir, the I am not I am not a witch. Cops in Springfield. Bad cops, bad cops. Bad cops, bad cops. Springfield cops are on the take. But what do you expect for the money we make? But cops winning formula couldn't work without the active participation of the people with the most to lose. Every person whose face you saw on the show, that person signed a release. They want me to go to bed with him, and I don't want to go to bed with him, so... You know. And I just found it shocking that they actually signed the waivers, like, hey, I'm going to be on cops. This is great. Uh, have you seen what you've done? <laughs> My name is Keith Burns. And in the 90s, I was a cop on cops. 
So after the dust settled, then the people that were arrested were in the back of a car, and the cops crew would then approach them and identify themselves. Goodbye, sir. It was the cameraman's responsibility to release the people involved. I barely get the word cameraman for the TV show, and they're like, cops, I was hoping you'd say, like, Where, give me that. You got a pen? Give me another pen. Man, I can't wait to tell my mama. Everybody just dumped all the empties into your car? Obviously, an intoxicated person can't uh, release themselves in that state or condition, so we'd have to get their phone number, and we'd follow up with them when they were less intoxicated. Touch the tip of your nose. You know, we'd, we'd ask nice, and I'll, and I'll tell you this, I, okay. I got at least a couple of releases with a kind word and a cold can of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Be surprised how a little bit of good salesmanship can, can get a good release. I can tell you right now the reason that people sign the release. It's because for five minutes of fame, they'll do anything. One of the funniest incidents I was involved in... Stands in this window with his curtains up. This woman, every time she would do the dishes, her neighbor would climb up onto his kitchen sink and... You know... What? And it's embarrassing. He plays with himself. Oh, okay. So I get there. Now there's a film crew with me. Come on, if I come in and talk to you? Sure. Thank you. And he was wearing nothing but a towel. And in front of 60 million people, he confessed to exactly what he did. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I knew what I was doing was wrong. I just find her sexually attractive, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it was... So it's bizarre. I mean, is it necessary for me to be arrested? Well, see, we consider it illegal to uh, masturbate in front of women in this state. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Now, remember, this was before social media. This was giving them the opportunity. Jeez, I'm going to be on national television. Am I going to be on cops one day? One day you're going to be on cops. Oh, well, hey. But was this just people looking for their chance to get on television, no matter the cost? Or was there more to it? You see those clips that they want you to see. You don't see the reality of the situation, and you don't see the idea of like, this larger structure of law enforcement. Turn around! Put your hands on the car! You move, I'll, I'll break your head open. It didn't happen every time. There were plenty of people who had enough sense to say no. I never you ran them cameras. All right, track your ass, bastard. If the person refused to sign, the one around with the they money. would just blurt their face out. So if you ever see the cops episode, their faces are blurred out. They refuse to sign the waiver. The show's groundbreaking style also wins over the TV industry. In the early 90s, Cops is nominated four times for an Emmy and wins Best Reality-Based Program at the 1993 American Television Awards. Over the years, I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, it wasn't all really real, was it? I mean, some of that was staged, right? No. Everything that you saw on the Cops TV show was true reality television. There was no staging. There was no coaching or acting. We were warned by the FCC, don't say this is real if it's not. You could get into a lot of trouble that way. If it happened in front of my lens, on, like, drop the bag. you saw it on TV. Well, you saw it if the local police department gave their okay. To help make sure they did, the show's producers, Barbara and Langley, were willing to filter reality to help their subjects look their best. That's one of the key things that I don't think the public ever understood about the show was it was truly a partnership between the production company and these law enforcement agencies. Police department! The house is on fire! Come out! The agencies had editorial control. If they see something that they think would be an embarrassment to the agency, they can always say, you know what, we don't want that. Don't put that on there. He, he kicked the door in on the wrong house. How do we write this one up? You're the supervisor, you tell me. And Barbara Langley, of course, has to go along with that in order to have the access to these police agencies. I mean, we were pro-police. I mean, that's why we were called cops. Otherwise, they call us robbers. And working alongside police all day can blur the line between crew and cop. Once we had uh, cornered this hot car up in Ohio, and the kid did a leg bail into a apartment complex. When I saw Richie, cameraman, and our officer go one way, I came back the other way. I was on some steps, and he was running right toward me. And I realized, you're tired, <laughs> you want to end this thing. 
So as he ran by, I jumped off the steps, just like Batman, and I took him to the ground. And to my horror, I see Richie with the camera filming me. And I said, oh, no. So I got off him, like, real quick, because I could have lost my job. I got it. I got it. But I didn't. They left it in there. But you have to really look for it, because it's so quick. And you say, wait a minute, did that really happen? Who was that? Actually, that's happened quite a few times. Hat, son. No, don't worry about your hat, son. You're under arrest. This version of reality seen on Cops turns Barber and Langley's low-budget series into a lucrative global brand. Now, here's your chance to own official Cops gear. Cops gear is available from your favorite retailer's cop shop. This show is now making a ton of money or directly from cops the store what's essentially happening is that you get this sort of glossy hollywood advertisement for policing but while the cops camera crews captured their law enforcement approved version of policing a much uglier glimpse of police at work is caught on a camera the cops don't control Unlike a lot of other cops, Broward County Deputy Sheriff Linda Canada has done her job on national television. Portraying they patrol Linda officers as heroes Fox. makes cops a ratings hit in the early 90s. Comfort a little girl who was frightened of her mother's boyfriend. How about if I drive by and shine my light through the window so you know that I was here? I'll just come by and check Linda Canada may be the face of pro-cop propaganda. Not a celebrity. But not everyone is buying the feel-good story that cops is selling. Absolutely, there were people who saw this show as problematic and challenging because it was part of the selling of an uh, unjust justice system to the American public. I'm Rashad Robinson. I'm the president of Color of Change. Yeah, you're looking sharp. Doing my best. <laughs> Doing my best. And in the 90s, I was leading youth protests out in my community on Long Island. <laughs> Black and brown communities have always been treated like enemy combatants from police officers. Whether it was from the very first police departments, which were slave patrols, to the batons and the hoses that were sprayed upon our people when we were marching to be able to express our will for a better future through the vote, to all of the police officers that constantly get off for violence. Time and time again, police officers' lives have been put far above the lives of everyday people in ways that no other profession in our society um, gets treated. But in the early 90s... On memory uses full-size VHS tapes. Place Advances in personal video cameras will open the door for citizens to expose hidden societal injustices. We saw a huge rise in people being able to film things for themselves and tell their own stories. And one of the biggest stories of the decade is captured on this home recording. The three police officers facing felony criminal charges were among a group of 15 who stopped a 25-year-old... In this pre-internet era, the footage of LAPD officers beating Rodney King becomes the TV news equivalent of a viral video sensation. Now the story that might never have surfaced if someone hadn't picked up his home video camera. We've all seen the pictures of Los Angeles police officers beating a man... We see this on-screen all across the news, everywhere. Civil rights organizations say the Los Angeles Police Department has a history of brutality and misconduct. Law enforcement agencies denounced the officers' actions as an anomaly and a stain on the profession. But Chief Gates today called the LAPD a model department and said he has no plans to resign. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stacey C. Kuhn, not guilty of... On April 29th, 1992, the four officers charged in Rodney King's beating are found not guilty. L.A. explodes in the aftermath. Within an hour of the verdict, roving angry gangs were taking to the mean streets of South Central Los Angeles. Video cameras... As crowds build on a corner in downtown L.A., police gather nearby. 
but refused to engage. Within minutes, unchecked by police who were nowhere in sight, the mob began looting stores. When they finally move in, it's too late to stop the rioting. The police are powerless, left to form skirmish lines. They don't represent the people no more. Rocks, plants, anything that the protesters could actually give a hand on. Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley urged citizens to show their outrage in a constructive manner. We don't want you to resort to violence. That would only destroy every positive thing that we have been doing. The mayor didn't know it, but it was already too late. 37 people dead, more than 1,300 injured. More than 4,000 arrested. Damage estimate, $200 million and rising. A few hours ago, the man who'd become the unwilling symbol of this outbreak of violence decided it was time to speak out. Rodney King appealed for peace. I just want to say, you know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? The White House takes a hard line against the violence, but is indifferent to the police action that provoked it. What we saw last night and the night before in Los Angeles is not about civil rights. It's been the brutality of a mob, pure and simple. Out on the streets, the anger only intensifies. Gotcha! Performer Ice-T is hot this summer. His album Body Count and the song Cop Killer are moving up the music charts with a bullet, but cops and others are angered by these lyrics. I'm about to kill me something. A pig stop me for nothing. Cop killer, better you than me. They still got to deal with the question, why did I write this record? Cops have beaten on my friends. They, they deal with us like we're savages. They call us savages. They pull you out the car. They call you <laughs> You don't know. Unless you are in the car with me, you don't know. But black people know. And in major cities, voices begin calling for diversity, demanding police departments hire more men and women who actually know what it's like to be black in America. Nowhere is the need for change more keenly felt than in Los Angeles. The new regime recognizes that the show Cops, with its positive portrayal of police officers, could play an important role in changing the reputation of the LAPD. At first, the police chief said, no, we don't want cops here. The very next police chief said, yes, bring them here. We need to fix our PR. Come here. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Well, it's not just the LAPD. It's other police departments that actually sought out cops to help them build a new image. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know, Instead of actually doing the deeper examination, it's, instead of actually digging into accountability, the police departments lean into public relations. And for the police officers, appearing on COPS is an opportunity that's too good to pass up. I absolutely believe that being on COPS is great PR for COPS, absolutely. That was one of the reasons I agreed to do it. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! The overwhelming majority of police officers are out there to do the right thing the right way, help their community, make it a safer place. Sheriff's office, put your hands up, I can see him. Stay in the car, stay in the car, put your hands up. We live there too, so we'd like to make a difference in the community. You have anything in your pockets I should know about? Any needles, anything that can hurt me? And do it the right way, be a part of the community and be accepted by the community for what we do. Powder cocaine. You are presenting and representing the entire police profession when you are on that show. So you're high and you're watching the kids. I know. That's important. As far as I'm concerned, I think you should go to jail. That's, a, that's an opportunity. An opportunity to touch the lives of others and let them see what it's really like to be a cop. We don't want to ruin, we don't want to ruin your kids' lives. We don't want to ruin them either because they're good kids. I think you need more help than you go in jail. The problem is I'm very concerned about those little kids. They call drugs a victimless crime. Yeah, I got three little victims in there. It's uh -huh. them. Many people became cops because of cops. You know, um, this idea of seeing people make a difference on screen, at least, and you're seeing a difference, you want to be a part of it. But being a part of the team actually making the show, that was a mixed bag. It was, uh, it was a dangerous gig, for sure. No doubt about it. And for Mark, that danger comes from a place he least expects. I was accidentally shot by a policeman I was working with in Chesapeake, Virginia. Turn around. Turn around. Hey, hey, stop, stop, stop. In the 90s, 
being a cop on cops can be risky business. But it can be just as dangerous behind the camera. We had close calls all the time. Guns that were discovered after the fact. Gun case under here? Yeah, un underneath the bed. Ah, man, I can't tell you how many crazy car chases I've been in. All of us who worked on the show frequently asked ourselves, which one of us is going to be the first to be hurt in a car crash? Oh. The interesting thing about Mark is that he's the first crew member that's that gotten shot. We got a radio call about gunfire in the neighborhood in Chesapeake, Virginia. Coming into the neighborhood and the headlights swing across this group of young men and they're just walking down the sidewalk and they're kind of looking over their shoulder at us and you know. And officer approaches the guy who called. Hey, what's going on tonight? Well, I was out here and I heard gunfire and I saw those guys, they had a gun and they put it right there in the trunk of that car. And officer I'm with opens up the trunk and sure enough, there's a shotgun laying right there in the trunk of the car. And I'm standing right in front of him. And at some point he starts to lift the gun up like he's gonna look at it. And I'm watching him in the viewfinder and the words were forming on my lips. Hey, don't you wanna check that fire and make sure it's safe? And just through simple geometry, he lifts the gun up and his finger rolls back in the trigger guard, presses the trigger, and the gun goes off. Fortunately for me, it is not a direct hit. But I get the, the, the shock wave and the fire, and man, it literally took me off my feet. And the sound man completely loses his mind. He thinks I'm dead. He's walking around in a circle over here, just screaming at the top of his lungs at this policeman. And when this happens, I did not hit the button to stop it. And the camera rolled until it ran out of tape. So it's laying on the side, documenting the whole scene. Murray Jordan was the producer at the time. Comes to me in the hospital. He's like, Mark, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. You know, you're there, you got the thing, the gun goes off, bam, it back. You got the whole thing, it's, it's unbelievable. I'll make sure you get a dub so you can show your grandkids someday. You're gonna love it, it's unbelievable. To this day, I've never seen it. I never got a dub. Mark's never shared, never aired friendly fire shooting is an example of how a cops only presents police in a positive light. And in the 90s, police are increasingly seen as the solution to every problem. We incarcerate more people in this country than anywhere else in the world. Cops in the 90s was happening at the same exact time where so many of these laws were being passed around the country that put us in this mass incarceration crisis. If people cannot stop doing things that threaten other people's lives, they simply shouldn't be eligible for parole. Like the crime bill in 94 that President Clinton pushed. And that is the genesis of the three strikes and you're out. More officers on the street is one anti-crime measure that experts agree works. Several of the president's other initiatives are far more controversial. Among them, the so-called three strikes and you're out amendment, mandating life without parole for those who commit a third violent felony. The TV show cops, right alongside the press releases from police departments and the policies being passed by both Democrats and Republicans, really led to us being a country that treats every single sort of challenge we have in our society as something to incarcerate someone for, especially if that person is black or brown. These shows like Cops, what they do is they give us a hero law enforcement figure. They give us a, a criminal person that has no back story. Oftentimes, someone who's black or brown or poor and white. But when it comes to the white suffrage that are apprehended, it seems like they talk to them more, it's more conversational, it's like a laughing matter. How come you did that? When it comes to a drug perpetrator, a drug pusher, who's usually black or brown on the show, they're seen more like as savages. You know, they're tackled, wrangled to the ground, house broken into. Stick your hands up. Stick your hands up. Stick your hands up. Scientific studies of the show Cops would later prove this inherent racism. Those who are actually per perpetrating the crimes, that's a race based as well. Crack was seen uh, as a destructive, cheap drug for poor communities of color, and we see that 
in this show. Let me tell you, there's plenty of white people selling drugs in their you know, posh neighborhoods behind the gated communities, but they're not doing that overtly in the street like a prostitute or a crack dealer on the street corner. We don't see the Wall Street individuals getting handcuffed for their cocaine habits. And what this does is continuously put in our mind this idea that these black and brown individuals are the ones who are committing these crimes solely, and that simply doesn't work with the math of individuals um, who are actually committing these crimes on a larger scale outside of the media. You know, TV has a tremendous impact on what we do and what we think. The information that comes into our homes through TV educates us about so many different things that we may not be able to touch or understand. And then on Saturday nights, people are turning on this show that is telling them these horrible things are happening in these communities where they don't live. And the, and the thing that is keeping um, these people from coming into their communities and harming them are these police officers. Remember what this is. This is entertainment. This is a, this is a commercial enterprise that we're both getting something out of this, right? Barbara Langley is getting paid handsomely to produce this show. On the ground. On the ground. The police are not getting paid anything. What the hell do you think you're doing out there? Sheriff's Department. But what it does, it gives us the opportunity to show the public who we, who we really are. How you doing? Chasing bad guys, ma'am. In, in a sense. Stay out of my yard. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You can't package something that says it's reality about policing, then let police officers and police departments at the end decide what you actually get to see. We're talking about the reality of this gritty, raw police department. What actually is real is whatever the police department wants you to see is real. By the end of the decade, the filtered reality of cops becomes even more detached from what's really happening in the country. You know, starting in the 90s, violent crime starts to go down. It was called Operation Hammer. The violence of the war on drugs era reaches its peak in 1991. And by 99, rates of violent crime across the country drop almost 50% and keep dropping. For the streets of LA. But every year that Pew Research tracks it, they show that Americans believe violent crime is just steadily going up. And so there's a gap that ends up happening between perception and reality. Information to our cars, and the climate of outsized fear that cops has helped create is about to get much, much worse. By the end of the 90s, COPS is showing its age. Ratings are a quarter of what they once were. But the way we look at law enforcement is about to change dramatically. After 9-11, the war on drugs gives way to the war on terror. This crusade, this War on terrorism is going to take a while, and the American people must be patient. Police forces become increasingly militarized in the name of keeping America safe. And more than ever, cops are universally being held up as national heroes. That is not only inaccurate, but is deeply dangerous, because what it does is it prevents us from actually doing the real work to solve both the challenges that we have in policing and the challenges that we have with safety and justice in our communities. For a growing number of Americans, it seems obvious that keeping America safe really means keeping white people safe. The killing of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of the man who pulled the trigger just confirms these beliefs. Story causing heartache and anguish in southern Florida now. The feds are saying that they're in contact with local police. Investigating the killing of a teenager by a neighborhood watch volunteer. That's an incident raising alarm among civil rights leaders. Not committing any crime. No. Our son is your son. Yeah. 
to think of the system as inherently good is wrong because this system in and of itself was created without black people in mind. It was created to help increase white power. Activists reach out to the company that helped define America's understanding of policing to see if they might want to cancel the show in light of this new reality. During this moment where people are in the streets, where people are protesting, we reached out to Fox. And the folks at Fox were not interested. But with more pressure, Fox reconsiders. The day before, as we, I was actually heading off for the protest in front of their studios, Fox reached out and said they wouldn't be renewing the show. Fox cancels its longest running series in 2013 after 25 seasons on air. Cops. But Cops gets a second life on another network. That's when Cops moved to Spike TV. New episodes of Cops, Saturdays at 8 on Spike. Cops did what it did with Fox. It brought new eyes to the network and it increased its viewership. The show's successful run on cable proves there's an audience that thinks Cops still has stories worth telling. Suspects are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. A show that, that reveals what police do, there is not only a place, it's essential that people see it. But today, the internet delivers its own version of this show without police censoring what they don't like. And 25 years after Rodney King, shocking video evidence of police killing black men is piling up. 1619, both officers okay, suspect down. I need an EMS code three. Cops was an expression that didn't have a retort. There are so many retorts now through the phones that people carry in their hands and the videos that get posted on social media. The gatekeepers have been removed. Demands for justice and police accountability get louder. Until the widening gap between the police you see on cops and the police you see on YouTube triggers global outrage. At the height of the protests, Cops is canceled again. Cops, one of the longest running TV shows, has been canceled in the wake of George Floyd's death. And the social political environment of the year 2020 doesn't surprise me at all. Give me your ID. No punk. I got plenty of chances to tase you. Its 33rd season was set to premiere next Monday, but the Paramount Network now tells ET that's not happening, and we don't have any current or future plans for it to return. One year later, the show's creator, John Langley, dies of a heart attack during a cross-country off-road race in Mexico. But despite Langley's death, cops, much like the debate over policing in America, lives on. Cops is a cultural mainstay. Whether you liked it or not, unfortunately, as many people still believe in this ideal of how the police look. And I think that cops will find a home somewhere. As of October 2021, new episodes of Cops, produced by Langley's son, are once again airing in the U.S. on a streaming service owned by Fox News. There are real stories to actually tell when it comes to policing in this country. And it is the responsibility of all of us to hold media accountable when they create these deep deep divides between perception and reality.